Well, I want to welcome y'all to another episode of Info Minds Presents. Now, this episode is featuring Napoleon from the Outlaws. Now, Mo, let's tell the people where you was born and raised, bro. Well, I'm originally born in Newark, New Jersey, raised in Irvington, between Irvington and Newark, mainly Irvington, New Jersey. So tell me what you recall about your early childhood growing up in um, Irvington, New Jersey. You know, it was wild, especially when the crack epidemic started to spread across the inner cities of America. When it hit Irvington, everything changed. At one particular time, there was a good amount of white people living in Irvington. By the time I started growing up and hit the, my young age in the 80s, 11, 12 years old, man, it was um, predominantly African-American, and it was wild. You know, the crack came, people started hustling, the guns got involved. It just became a wild environment growing up. So tell me about your family life. How many brothers and sisters did you have? From my mother and father, you know, I had two siblings, two brothers. My father had two kids, two sons that's older than me and my brother. So all together was five of us. My grandmother was the pillar of the family. She was a strong black woman that kept us all together. She was originally from West Virginia. So she had that old school upbringing with her. And my aunties, my uncles, we were all close. Cousins, all of us, we was close, you know what I mean? Now, Mo, we know it's public information that your mother and father lost their lives very tragically. Tell us what type of lifestyle did they live? What were some of the circumstances involved in that situation? Parents, they was actually pretty young when they passed away. My father, he was a businessman. From what I know, he was slinging diamonds at a very young age. And his business, it was a lot of risk involved, especially for a young African-American, a young black male back then. When he was like 22, 23 years old, he was making hundreds of thousands of dollars. Somehow he got involved in a diamond trade and he was flying all around America with his homies. And he married my mother when she was about 17 years old. You know, they met in high school, had their first child, which was my brother, Mooney. Yeah, they got murdered by someone that was close to him. It was a person who was my godfather. He was very close with my father. He used to call my grandmother, my father's mother. You know, he used to refer to her as his own mother when he see her. You know, I hear different stories. I think there's a lot that my family try to keep from us. I hear stories from the streets. I hear stories from other relatives. I've read stories online. A lot of the stuff is public information. You know, I read the testimony from the main guy who put the hit together. I guess there was an incident. My father got into a dispute over how the money should be split on one of the sales of the diamonds. One of the guys, he got rowdy. He did some things that was a little harsh. I guess my father and his homie at that time, they thought the best reaction was to defend themselves. They shot him. So I guess the dude that was with my father when he shot the dude or whatever, you know, it got back to his homies who was also my father's homie and they just put a plan together to put a hit out on my father. And that's actually what I read online. You know, then I heard they was in debt to my father and they didn't want to pay him back so they just decided to put a hit out on him. Now I know this is a very touchy subject, but can you tell us what happened to your parents and how old were you at the time? I was three years old when they got killed. They came in the house, Dawood, who was the main guy, who was my godfather, he sat me on his lap. One of the only things I can remember from the incident is that he pushed me off his lap. And I recall it was violent. That's when he started shooting. I don't recall what happened after that. One of the other things I recall is that biting my mother on the chest trying to wake her up. You know, when he came and discovered the bodies, they found out that my mother had bite marks all over her chest because we was in the house with the bodies for 24 hours for a whole day. One of my father's friends, Amir, who was on the phone with my father when the shooting first started happening. He just heard the line, just got busy for the whole day. He kept trying to call. So when he went the next day, that's when he discovered the bodies. Wrapped us up. I got a bullet that skinned me in the foot. So I was bleeding. I had to get rushed to the hospital. After the death of our parents, we was fortunate enough to live with my grandmother, my grandparents' house. What was life like growing up without your mother and father? And how did it change you? And what effect did it have on you going forward? I'm sure, man, that it affected me in ways that I probably can't really put my hands on it. You know, as kids, we used to go to therapy, me and my brothers, and then that stopped. I'm sure the death of my parents have something to do with the way I was very angry, a very angry dude. Even though my grandparents, my aunts, my uncles, they did a good job raising us. But it was tough, you know what I mean? It was tough. I used to go to school, and it's Mother's Day, for example, and you see people making cards for Mother's Day, Father's Day, or things like that. So I had to endure all of that without being emotional. We're trained to not be emotional 
we're trained to just hide our emotions. Like if we start crying, like, man, I feel sad that I don't have a card to write for my mother. The reaction of people around you will be like, man, you a sucker, man. Shut up, man. You know what I mean? So we grew up in that environment where we couldn't really show our emotions. Tell me what you recall about your teenage years. Growing up in your grandparents' household, you know, most of the times your grandparents may be a little bit up in age. And you know, as teenagers, we take advantage of that. And I was a wild teenager, but I wasn't the wildest due to the fact that my brothers, my cousins, it was a lot of us. And when we walked out of our house to go to our block, we were something to be reckoned with because we rode as one. Like for example, my brother Mooney, he was known to have hands ever since he was a young kid. He just loved to fight. He probably got into a fight every single day until he made a name for himself, knocking big dudes out, small dudes. So my family started having a reputation like these dudes are not to be messed with. So I had homies and family that just pretty much uh, validated the reason for me to be wild. I grew up with this chip on my shoulder. No one could do anything to me because, for example, if I start trouble and if it's somebody who's bigger than me, my brother would step in. If it's somebody bigger than him, one of the homies would step in. So I grew up as a wild individual that had my block behind me, my cousins behind me, 12, 13 years old man I was on the block trying to sell cocaine what made me change though is that I started to realize that everybody around me was going to jail or getting killed even at that young age even at 12 13 years old I realized that this is not what I want for the rest of my life so I started to figure a way like how can I have something else another hustle actually like one of the first times that I ever went out and tried to sell drugs I got locked up and I probably was like 11 years old 12 years old I was so young that they didn't even keep me in jail they found like a crack valve in my pocket I tried to hide the rest and one slipped in my pocket so they pretty much let me go but from there on I was like man I got to do something that nobody else in my family or nobody else in my neighborhood can do and that's when I started writing raps Tell me, how did you connect with Pac? And how old was you at the time? And what do you recall about that first meeting? I connected with Pac through Yasmin, who was the mother of Yafeo, AKA Gaddafi. She was a childhood friend of one of my cousins. They was cool, they pretty much used to hang with each other back in the day. So I knew Yafeo when we was kids. Lost contact with him, Gaddafi that is. I ran into his mom's again, told her I was rapping. She said, my son is doing the same thing. And at this time, Pac had one album out already. You know, so he was known already as an up and coming artist. He already had hits, so I knew who he was. So she was like, Pac is coming to New York along with Yafeo, go meet him. I think I would say I was about 14 years old. Got on the train, went to New York to the hotel room, met him, and we've been connected ever since. So yo, bro, let's fast forward a little bit. Now, how did you end up becoming a member of the Outlaws? Because um, if my memory served me correct, before you guys was the Outlaws, it was Drama Sight. Was you a member of the group? And who else was members of Drama Sight? Most people don't know, before it was Drama Sider, we was called the Young Thugs. It was myself, Gaddafi, Edie, and Castro. But we went by the names of, I was Little Moo, Gaddafi was Young Hollywood, Castro was K-Dog, Edie was Big Malk. So this was a group before we formed Drama Sider. Pac later on changed the name to Drama Sider. It was more of a Oakland, like Bay Area slang. And the way they used to talk, they used to say, for example, yeah, man, that's dope recital, man. Yeah, that's hot recital. Like, they had this Bay Area slang. Pac got a lot of his slang from his music, mainly from E-40. Like, E-40 is known to have slang words and talk slick. That's a Bay Area thing. So drama recital was one of those things. So Pac, he called his drama recital after Young Thugs. So I was definitely one of the members. So why did Pac change the name drama recital to the Outlaws? And what was the motive behind that? And how did you get the name Napoleon? Pac, when he was in prison, we actually signed a contract with Endoscope Records as Drama Sider. We did a whole album. We signed with Endoscope, flew out to LA. And then when Pac in jail, you can't really do much but just contemplate, think, read. That's when he started changing. That's when he started saying, you know what? I'm gonna switch it up. I don't even want y'all to put this album out on Endoscope. I'm going to Death Row Records and I'm gonna form a new group. First it was Outlaw Immortals. And he's like, I'm gonna give you guys names of tyrants, change everybody name. Myself, man, I had a fiery temper. Pac used to joke and say I had the short man complex. So that's how I got the name Napoleon. So Moo, tell me who were all the members of the Outlaws? Was that group handpicked by Pac? Or were you guys already running around and hanging out together? Like Edie, 
Castro, Gaddafi, that's part family. They grew up since childhood. They was family pretty much. Castro was the first cousin of Pac. Gaddafi, him and Pac grew up calling each other brothers because of their parents being so close with each other in the Black Panthers. Edie, his moms grew up with them. Pac moms and Gaddafi moms. So they all grew up as young kids together. Also part of the outlaws was Thug Life members. Mo Prem, he's the son of Matulu Shakur, which is Pac's stepbrother. So they also been like family. Even the people that introduced Pac to Big Psych was family from Watani. He was one of the Black Panther members that came up with a Faney from LA, but moved to Atlanta. His cousin Big Surge was a homie with Big Psych. So that's how he got introduced to Big Psych. It pretty much was a family affair. And also Storm, which is the only and first female outlaw. And then you had other people that Pac was putting in the click of the outlaws like later on you had nutso for example even whack deuce whack deuce is from sugar in them hood you know these are people that Pac was allowing to be part of the outlaw click under his blessings fatal sorry about that i forgot to mention fatal he grew up with Gaddafi and um montclair and later on nob came he also grew up with Gaddafi and fatal and montclair so we was all family me growing up in hollis queens right i had a um a close friendship with Randy Stretch Walker, which is Stretch. And you know, that was Pac's right-hand man at one point in time. My question to you is, you know, Pac died when he was 25. Stretch died when he was 27, if I'm not mistaken. You know, the world knows that they had a falling out. With all the years that has passed, do you think as with Pac would be in, in his late 40s right now, and so would Stretch, do you would think that they would have been able to circle back and be able to work their friendship out being at the long history that them guys had together you know the reason i ask that question is bro because me being a shorty and being you know one of the younger guys me and you probably around the same age but i was one of the younger guys that was coming up around stretch so you know we was in the studios remember pop coming to new york you know hollering at scratch stretch going to the hotel and in the city and all that running around the city with pop all the time you know what i mean me knowing pop Pac was the type of person, he was just and feared to the best of his ability. And it was a lot of love that Pac and Stretch had for each other. And from what I know, even when Pac did that song, When You See Me, You Better Holler At Me. In other words, when he sees Stretch, he need answers. A lot of things didn't add up for Pac. And you gotta remember, man, after Pac came home to death row, he was only around for nine months. And it was a lot of unanswered questions that if he would have got the chance to sit down with Stretch and Stretch would have been able to explain certain things that Pac was curious or it wasn't adding up, you never know, man. I think Pac would have matured and they would have sat down. If Pac was even ready to do that to Biggie, on a few occasions, Pac was like, I don't really want nothing bad to happen to Biggie. I heard him say that on a few occasions. And even Madge, for example, we ran into Madge many, many times back in LA with the homies. I'm talking about Pac Day Ones from LA, from Oakland, um, Country, Manute, Surge. He's still connected with the same people who was Day Ones for Pac in LA. And when he came to LA, we kicked it. He's still real close with Mo Prime, which is Pac's brother. We was his young dudes, hotheads back then. We looked at it, especially myself, when Stretch was coming, you know, bringing messages from Jimmy Hitchman as a hothead. I was looking at it from a standpoint of view like, nah, this shouldn't even be tolerated. But Pac was a little older, a little more mature than us. And he looked at things differently. I think it would have been a time that him and Pac would have sat down. I never heard Pac say anything like he wanted something bad to happen to Stretch. That's another thing. You got people saying that Pac had something to do with his murder. Nah, definitely. He definitely didn't have nothing to do with it. I heard an interview from Madge. And when he started explaining stuff, and I was like, wow, that makes sense. He said that Jokers was calling his mother house threatening his mother. His mother was still living in the hood and they didn't have the money to relocate. So they couldn't really just fully go to war on the behalf of Pac when people were knowing their mother address. So it was always two sides to the story. Knowing Pac, Pac the type of person, man, when he have love for somebody, his love is like solid. And what I think, I can't say I'm sure, but from what I think, you know, Pac being a mature person, who's a just person, he probably would gave Stretch that opportunity to sit down and holler at him. And if it would have made sense to Pac, I'm sure they would have shook hands and kept it moving. Remember there was an interview with Pac on the Box TV in New York, right? Now you make a brief appearance in that video. Now I think it was you and members of Thug Life, Stretch, E-Money Bags. Do you remember anything about that day or that interview? That was the first time that I met Thug Life homies, Big Psych, Rated R, Macadocious. I get the phone call that they coming over. I forgot who gave me the call. I was in touch with Gaddafi and them, or maybe he asked me, and they was like, Pac is coming back to New York with his group, Thug Life. He wants you to come up there. 
that was me coming around from Jersey, the part of Jersey I was from, Irvington and North, just to get to Manhattan was a 30 minute drive on the train. So I went up there, man, and I remember he put me on blast, even on the box, told me to spit some rhymes. And that's why you see that picture with like eat money bags and Pac and them hugging me. They edited that part out, but he made me freestyle. Now more in 95 when Pac was on the island, where was you at at that time? He wasn't really in Rockers Island too long, if I'm not mistaken. I kind of get it twisted, but um, confused a little bit. But he went to Clinton Max State Prison. Parked there like a year and a half, if I'm not mistaken. We was in Jersey. We was going back and forth visiting him. I think we might have did visit him a few times on Rocker Islands, and then he went to Clinton Penitentiary, and we used to fly into Canada or go to New York and drive up. I was in Jersey at that time. Have you ever met Haitian Jack or Jimmy Henchman? And did you ever have any interactions with them throughout your travels with Pop? I never met Haitian Jack or Jimmy Henchman until after Pop passed away. We ran into Haitian Jack. We was in Las Vegas at some event. I forgot exactly what it was. I think he was with Mike Tyson. We was with Big Psych, Outlaws, a few of us. One of the Outlaws was like, that's the dude Haitian Jack right there. And I was also with my brother, Quim, Reef, some Jersey dudes. My brother was like, oh yeah, let's go over there. So myself and my brother and the Jersey homies, we walked up to him and was like, what's up, you Haitian Jack? He was like, yeah. My brother's like, you got a problem with my brother right here from the Outlaws? And Haitian Jack was like, I don't even know your brother. And then I was like, by the way, man, I'm from the Outlaws. Napoleon, we need answers. Rumors that you had something to do with Pac. We know you're supposed to be a solid street dude, and so we want to know what's up with that. What happened with Pac? What happened with that situation? And Haitian Jack was like, like I said before, I never set up Pac. I never sent anyone to shoot Pac. He's like, Pac said some things in the newspaper. Street dudes that's around me wasn't feeling it, and they decided on their own to go and try to do something to Pac. He was like, but I never sent anyone. Pac was my homie, even though we fell out, but I never sent anyone to do anything to Pac. And I met Jimmy Henchman after I accepted the religion of Islam. I was Muslim and it was Ramadan. And I was in the King Faha Mashid in Los Angeles to break my fast. And I seen all these dudes in there would think his company was Caesar Entertainment. And I seen them sitting down. I think I might have seen pictures of them before. So when I seen all these Caesar Entertainment jackets on, I went up to him. I was a new Muslim two years. First, I was like, you Muslim? He said, yes. I said, Salaam Alaikum. And I was like, yeah, man, I need to know what's up, man. You know, we're in a mad shit. It's Ramadan. We ain't on no negative stuff. But I need to know the truth about what happened with Pac. So he started talking. He's like, you know, Pac. Similar story to Haitian Jack. He was like, Pac came at me, said I did this and I did that. I had nothing to do with it. The little bit of Islam that I had is what was stopping me from reacting. And you know what I mean? I said, this is a Muslim brother in the mad shit. I don't think he telling those stories. And that was it. He got arrested and um, and I was shooting him some kites through somebody that knew him, Sabrina. She used to be our publicist and also a manager for Jimmy Henchman. So we was writing and he was talking about Islam. And I was like, look, man, you Muslim now, Alhamdulillah, Allah guided, you know, the brotherhood of Islam. There's no superior brotherhood, but you know what I mean? I just need to get this off my chest, bro. Let me know what happened with Pac. Come clean with that. And then he wrote back like I had nothing to do with it. And after that, he never wrote me again. He's like, I told you before I had nothing to do with it, this and that, and that was it. So yo, when Pac got released from prison, right? Did you relocate from New Jersey to LA? When Pac got locked up, I was actually living in his house in Atlanta. But when he got locked up, me and the outlaws, we flew to Jersey so that we'd be closer to him. Actually, before he went to prison, when he first got shot and checked himself out of the hospital, we flew to New Jersey and went to New York with him just to hold him down. So when he got out of prison, you know, Shook sent him a private airplane. Big Psych flew on the plane to come pick him up. He went straight to LA. He got introduced to Fatal while he was in prison through Gaddafi. Fatal and um, Gaddafi flew out there like the next day. And the rest of the outlaws, myself, Edie, Castro, we came out there a few days later. What was the difference between living in Jers and living in LA? And what adjustments did you have to make? Moving from Jers to LA, every ghetto was pretty much the same. But going from Jersey to LA, it was a lot of more discipline, there was a lot of more rules, and it was a lot of structure within street stuff because of the gang activities. Everybody is pretty much affiliated or gang member in LA whether they want to be or not. When I first went to LA doing the Dramacidal album, 
Big Psych, Rated R. You know, Big Psych was from IVC, which is Imperial Village Crip in Inglewood. Inglewood is predominantly Bloods. IVC, Imperial Village Crip, was a minority in Inglewood. Usually it's the other way around within LA. Rated R and Macadocious was from the Rolling 40 Crip neighborhood. And they was explaining to us these different things, how it works out there. So when I first went to LA, I was mainly around Crips and Big Psych was schooling me a lot. When we went back to Death Row, now we're mainly around majority bloods, parus, and now we're hearing the game from their side. And one of the things that I can say is the difference, especially back then, is that it was a lot of structure and loyalty in LA because it's tribal pretty much. In Jersey, it was a lot of cutthroat. Like my brother, he got his house shot up 11 times, man, crazy. Like he found about 11, 12 bullets in his dresser the next morning when he got his house shot up and the people that shot up his house was individuals that we grew up with our whole life. I'm not saying that this doesn't happen in LA, but it's rare back then because LA, you have to stick together because if you cross your own homies, your own set or your gang is not messing with you, you pray for the enemies. So you see that a lot of people in LA was more structured to be more loyal to each other because they had to. They didn't want to be kicked out their gang or be left alone. That's one of the things I was realizing. You know, they've been through so many wars. So it got to the point where people in LA is not running around looking for trouble because they like, man, are we really prepared to have another war? Where we from in Jersey, we walk around and we just look rough. Like we just waiting for somebody to say something to us. When I went back, it was like LA joke because it was just pretty much like, you know what? We want to avoid as much problems as possible because we don't want another war. We already lost 18 homies. So they had that mindset. LA is like my second home. I actually live more in LA than I did in Jersey. So I got a lot of love for the West Coast. So now, Mo, you young, you know, high-headed. You running around L.A. with Pac, one of the hottest rappers on the planet at the time. Did you ever run into any issues, gang-related shit? I was fascinated by gang culture, like just the way they move and the game that Big Psych was lacing me with. So I used to pay attention. I see Snoop, for example, and his crew, they cribs. Pac didn't let us hang with too many people, but Whack Deuce was one of them. He was Sugar Lil Homie. We just got real tight with him. You also have Bogart. That's another dude who was around Pac every day. He from Schoolyard Crips. He was Big Psych Homie that Big Psych introduced him to Pac when he was in prison. And also there was another dude from LA, Crip dude named Speedy. He's a legend out there that um, Pac used to allow us to hang around with other than that, he was very protective over us. Pac was wild, but he was very protective over us. But what we had to learn wearing our own color in a different neighborhood was serious. When we first got out there, we used to go to Venice Beach to play basketball. We knew fresh in Los Angeles. We used to wear red. A lot of us had red sneakers on, Nikes, hats or whatever. And while we playing basketball, Fader was out there with us, Gaddafi, myself. We was playing basketball. The basketball court got surrounded. We from the street, so we know like the people that surround in the court. We felt like it's something about to go down, but of course we have to keep our cool. We can't act intimidated and then they smell fear and then they really start rushing us. We just kept playing basketball. And one of the OGs, he was an older individual from the bunch. He came up to us and he was like, where y'all from? And we was like, Jersey, why, what's up? And he was like, why, wow, y'all new out here? We was like, yeah, we just moved out here, this and this and this and that. And he's like, okay, cool. I know you guys are being truthful because I can hear the East Coast accent in y'all, but let me just explain something to y'all. This is our hood, Venice Shore Line Chris. The homies over there, so they was ready to roll on y'all. But I was like, nah, let me just talk first. They said, we thought y'all was bloods because of the colors, but I took it on myself to say, let me just approach them and holler at them because they don't really seem like West Coast dudes. Especially back then, West Coast dudes now and East Coast dudes, they might dress the same pretty much right now. But back then, you can look at an individual clothes and say, yeah, he's from the East Coast or he from the West Coast. So my man was like, I decided to speak with y'all first and realize y'all not from around here. Y'all not even from Cali. So I, I just want to lay y'all how it goes. He said, wearing those colors over here is not a good thing and he was like but we're gonna give y'all a pass because y'all not from here y'all don't know the culture and that was it we was caught out of bounds you know we thanked them we said like, okay cool we keep that in mind <laughs> that was it you know did Pac had to pull you to the side and be like yo look don't be over here don't be over there Pac laced us big psych laced us bogart bogart from schoolyard crib he was a certified g big psych went to Pac like look man i need to introduce you to a, a known hitter in l.a 
he can be like a bodyguard with you and Bogart came around. So I used to spend a lot of time with Bogart. I used to go to his hood with him. In fact, we got into like a little argument and he was like joking with me. He's like, Mo, I'll take you to my hood. One of my young torpedoes or one of the young lopes, man, he'd do you dirty. And I was like, man, I ain't scared of none of your young lope, did this and this and that. And we got in the car. He let Pac know he was joking. So we got in the car and he's like, let's go then, let's go. I said, let's go. I'll fight any one of your young lopes. Let's just go. <laughs> so we got in the car, I was about to drive off and he drove off a little, then he started laughing like I'm joking with you. I see you got heart and it was a lot of love. And then when we start meeting Shug homies and other homies out there, it was love from both sides, Crips, Bloods, you know, whoever we was around, they really was lacing us how to move in LA. So we picked up early. You gotta respect the culture. We couldn't have a mindset. We like, man, we from Jersey. I'ma wear whatever we want. It doesn't work like that. We used to be on Crenshaw Boulevard. I think it was every Sunday, you know, the strip on Crenshaw Boulevard. People would come out there with their cars and their low riders and they'd just line up the block and just chill out there for hours. We used to be out there with the homies. A lot of people showed us love because we respected the code. We didn't come out there and start disrespecting people in their neighborhoods and their culture, you know? Did Syke and Mac and those guys from the IVC, did they feel some kind of way when Pac came home and started hanging around a gang of bloods? I first came home, Syke was with him. Big Syke, Bogart, they was with him on a daily basis. I don't think they really felt any kind of way. Not that I know of. You know, they was Crips. And they was around Pac every day, and Suge was around Pac every day. They didn't really feel no type of way. At that time, Macadocious and Rated R from the Rolling 40s, they wasn't around because they had a falling out with Big Sight. And they was wild. Macadocious and Rated R, they my big brothers. I'm in touch with them. Rated R locked up. He locked up for murder, which really was self-defense. Hopefully he get his due rights and his justice, and they look at his case and let him out. Somebody pushed up on him in his own backyard, and he defended himself, and now they're trying to give him life in prison. Macadocious, I'm in touch with him. They got into it in, in the scoop office one time, rolling 40s, raided on his homies against Big Sight. So I think Pac was like, you know what? I got to let these youngsters let loose for a little bit because they was too wild. I think Sight knew that if he would have brought somebody like Rated R, especially back then, who was a hothead to death row, it wouldn't have worked. Big Sight was more political and more wise with it. Big Sight can be up in death row and understand, but Macadocious and them, especially rated R, they was hotheads. I think Pac knew if he would have had them around death row, anything would have kicked off. For your move, when you was first introduced to Shug, what you think about him? I first met Suge and his homies, man. They just reminded me, you know, they were some big dudes. Like, everybody was buff. And they reminded me, like, you know, OGs from my neighborhood. I loved it back then because I was fascinated by wild environments. So I was fascinated by that crazy stuff. So I had nothing but love for Suge. And I used to always want to ride in a car with him. When we first got to L.A., I took a liking to Suge and Suge took a liking to me. And he met at Park House on Wilshire Boulevard. We all supposed to roll out somewhere. And Suge was like, move, roll with me. And I jumped in his Hummer. Park and the rest of the homies was following Suge. I think one of us got stuck at a traffic light and got lost. And I guess Suge just had to do his own thing. He took me to Compton. I spent the night in Compton. I was out hanging with him. And Pac was like, man, bring him back home. And Suge was like, nah, let's go to Vegas. I'm, can I take Mo to Vegas? And Pac was like, no. Because Pac knew I was very impressible at that particular time of my life where I looked up to these type of dudes. But Pac, the type of person he was, he was very protective over us. So he didn't want me to be around Suge and his homie too long from a standpoint of view. Like, man, these some wild dudes. Mo was out here in LA with me. I have to protect them and bring them back to my house. You know what I mean? From the time that I met Suge, it was all love. So take us to the time when you're in the studio and you guys are recording All Eyes On Me. Tell me what you remember about that time period. When I got to LA, three, four days later, man, Pac already had so many songs done. And when we first got there, they picked us up from the airport, took us to the hotel. Pac was staying at the Peninsula Hotel in Beverly Hills, and he had about three, four extra hotel rooms for us, the outlaws. And I remember walking in the room, and this is the first time I saw him since he came home. Opened the door, and it was like a small party there. You know, all his homies from LA, dudes and homegirls he didn't seen in years. So I walked in, and he was playing some music, and I remember one of them was um, Shorty Wanna Be A Thug. So he already had so many songs done. And from then, we were just going every day to the recording studio. He was just knocking them out. People was coming in, just showing a lot of love to him. Every day was like a reunion. A lot of people in LA, in the Bay Area was coming out, showing a lot of love. So for us, it was a fun environment. Nate Dogg was once quoted saying that he never went to the studio without his pistol. Tell me what the environment was like at Death Row Studio. The main studio at that time, and the only one was can -Am, out in the valley. It was a wild environment definitely was wild because it was full of gang members, full of gang bangers. You know, you have Bloods and Crips, Suge pretty much united 
all the Bloods and Piru sets, all of them from Compton, from LA. He was um, employing Bloods from different sets, whether it's Fruit Town, Piru, whether it's Bloods in LA, whether it's his hood, his neighborhood. And then you also had Snoop who was doing the same thing. You had Snoop in the studio and Nate Dogg who had homies like Trey D, Big C style, these are all known street dudes, real gang members. So it was a volatile situation that any moment it can just kick off. I think what kept the peace is that it was business and money being made, but there were incidents that popped off from here to there every once in a while. So it was a wild environment, it definitely was a wild environment. There was some kind of footage leaked of an altercation on the set of the Mavis again video shoot. Do you recall what happened to made Pop was this cool like that? That video shoot, I got into it with dudes that was playing on the opposite team of us in the video, one of the actors. He kept like talking slick all day and we kept arguing. Eventually it led to blows, like we just started hitting, you know what I mean? It was very disrespectful. Pop snapped and we just all started jumping at dude. Were you close with any of the Mob Pop Rule members? Like Heron, Buntry, Trayvon Lane? Did you know those guys? I knew all the homies from, um, like, sure, close homies, Neckbone, Buntry, Trey, Heron. I would say I was the closest to Trey. I'm still close with Trey and also Heron. After Pac died, I got even more closer to Heron. I used to go back and forth to Compton with him, kick it with him. These are some wild dudes, man, and we all was wild, so we connected with him. I remember when we first got to death row, we was in the hallway, and Heron like a straight G, and he walked in the hallway, and we were just against the wall, and you know, we East Coast dudes, and Heron was like, you know, he had this raspy gangster voice, he's like, what y'all waiting on the train or something? And we was like, man, what? He's like, y'all heard me, y'all waiting on the train? And he just kept walking. <laughs> so we went and told Pop, like, yo, man, this dude, when I shook homies, man, he seemed like he talking slick, man, something gonna happen. And Pop used to like, man, don't worry, I got this, these are the homies, don't worry. Pac was that type of dude, but we ended up clicking with Heron and Trey and all of them and becoming real close with him. Now, Mo, there's an individual named Mob James. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with him. He's done a ton of interviews on Vlad TV and all that. Now, do you recall him being around back then? And what type of dude was he? Well, Suge had so many dudes around him back then, but Mob James, I don't remember him like that, but he definitely was one of their homies. He was like Suge big homie. I seen some of his interviews, how he feel about Pac and the things that he say. You know, everybody have a right to their own opinion. He have a reason to feel that way because he come from that neighborhood. He's like one of the first people that was around when it first started and he put a lot of work in. So he look at it like, you know, but a lot of people had to realize, man, Pac had a lot of love from Bloods, Crips. His vision was how can he unite them? How can he stop them from killing and fighting each other? Despite him getting into a fight with Orlando. But Pac was the type of individual where he was closer with Bloods and and that's how he wrote. He had a lot of love and respect for all of them. Did you ever meet a guy named George? He was supposedly a close associate of Suge, but then he kind of turned rogue and kind of flipped on the mob pot rules. I met George. I remember George. He was at the hospital a lot when Pot got shot in Vegas. He was there a lot, like holding it down with us. That's the only time I remember him. Did you attend the 1996 MTV Awards in New York when Pac and Nas had that little confrontation? What's your take on it? was there at the MTV Awards. I think what happened between Pac and Nas was one of the most positive things that ever came out of anything relating to the so-called East Coast, West Coast beef. It's something that I think should have been more pushed, more promoted, more spread amongst the people because the negative side of anything that happens, people push it, they spread it. But it was an event that for us, we saw two generals, Pac and Nas. They was deep, we was deep. You know, the homies from my block alone came about 20, 30 deep. We had about eight guns with us, Gaddafi, Fatal, no, they homies was there. Nas and Pac stepped to each other like two generals and turned something negative into something positive. So for us to see that, man, it allow us to see as youngsters that it can be done, it can happen, that you can have a difference with someone and you don't have to always go to violence. They shook hands and they showed us how it was to be done. Now Puff's former bodyguard Gene Deal spoke about Pac and Death Row running up on Diddy at the 96 Soul Train Awards. He said Diddy ran. Was you there? And if so, do you remember anything about that night? I wasn't there, but I remember when Pac came back to where we was at, he was pumped up. He told us like, man, we just ran into Biggie and Puffy. And Pac was explaining that after having a little argument with Biggie, really Lil C's, he said Lil C's was running his mouth. The security and the police was keeping him away from each other. And um, Pac said when he ran into the building because he heard his name being called to go get his award, he heard Puffy coming down like, where they at? And Pac was like, we right here. And when he saw him, he said Puffy looked and lift up a window 
and jumped on to a tour bus out of the window. During this time, it was rumored that Puff was putting ransoms on death row chains. Is there any truth to that? That was the words, you know, that was going around on the streets is that he was saying, whoever bring this chain, you know, the here go $10,000, we want to put in a video. So that was something that we was hearing in the streets. Whether it was true or not, we don't know, but it was definitely going around the streets of LA. Now, according to former Crip Keefe D, Puff hired him in the Southside Crips for protection. Did you ever hear about this during that time period? You know, like they were saying like Puff was paying Keefe D and his homies to hold him down when he was in LA. That was also known that uh, when Biggie and Puffy, you know, was coming to LA, they was paying Southside Crips from Compton for protection. That was also known in the streets. I think even when Pac ran into Biggie and him at the Source Award, I believe some of the members from their hood was actually with Puffy and him at that situation. Now it was also alleged that Orlando Anderson and other members of the Southside allegedly jumped Trayvon Lane at the Lakewood Mall and took his chain. Did you hear about this? And is there any truth to that rumor? But these incidents opened the door to what led up to Pac passing away, his demise. That incident definitely happened at the mall. Trey and them got into it. They snatched his chain, but Trey got the chain back. They didn't leave with the chain. He definitely got the chain back and came around with the chain. It was an unfortunate situation that happened. I think Trey was with a few homies. The guys from the Southside Crip was with they peoples, and they tried to snatch the chain, and Trey and them fought back, took the chain back, and that pretty much led to all the other things that came after. Where were you when Pac got shot in Las Vegas? And what was going through your mind? And how did you feel? Can you give us a picture of that night and the days that followed and the days leading up to Pac ultimately being pronounced dead in that Las Vegas hospital? Pac got shot in Vegas. I was actually in Los Angeles at his house in Calabasas, California. We got the call. I believe it was Molly. She used to work for Pac, called Nobu, told Nobu. Pac got shot, called Pac House. I was out of the house at that time and said Pac just got shot. The first thing that came to my mind is that he got shot before. He's a strong individual. He's gonna make it out of this situation. We went to Las Vegas and then that's when we realized how serious it was from the surgeries that he was doing and then he was on life support. When he passed away, we was at the hospital. I think his mom's from what she felt is that he was suffering. She said she know Pac, man. He had to remove you know, certain body parts from him, like his lung. He lost finger and stuff like that. She was like knowing Pac, man, that, you know, he's a prideful individual. You know, his lung was gone. He probably won't even be able to make music anymore. He was suffering long enough, so she felt she wanted to pull a plug. That was the best thing for her to do at that particular time. People got a lot of love for Pac, so we didn't want to let him go. And that's why you hear the people saying he's alive. And he was like the Elvis for our generation, but unfortunately, Pop passed away. To this day, Pac's murder remains unsolved. Now we've heard all kinds of rumors from Puff allegedly hiring the Crips to take him out, Sugar allegedly wanting him dead because Pac supposedly wanted to leave death row. Now we've even heard that the LAPD and the FBI and the government was involved. All type of claims that Pac is somewhere in Cuba with Asada Shakur and that he faked his death. Now, what's your take and what do you believe happened? For sure, it wasn't nothing to do with Suge. Like everybody knows the streets you know what happened. Pac fought some people that was hardcore gang members. He got into a fight with Orlando Anderson. Well, that's part of West Coast protocol where you fight somebody, especially a gang member, they're gonna try to come back. He fought Orlando Anderson, who was known to be a gang member. You know, he had to go back to the hood saying, Pac did this and did that to you. He figured it's time to strike back. I think they knew it was a um, chance of that happening, especially like Suge and all his homies and even Pac. He lived a good amount of time on the West Coast and he knew how it works out there, but I don't think nobody expected it to happen the way it happened so fast and so soon. They probably thought when they got back to LA, things could happen, retaliation might happen or something like that. But it, unfortunately, man, it took Pac, you know, his life. He was a young dude, 25 years old. And most people look at it like, well, Pac was fighting because of a crib and he was with the Bloods. You know, Pac look at it from a standpoint of view that word on the street is that Orlando Anderson was trying to snatch that chain because Puffy was paying him. So Pac look at it like, you know, this beef is pretty much my beef just as it's Trayvon beef. And another thing people, a rumor that people spread is that they say Trey went to Pac and whispered to Pac and said, yo, Orlando Anderson, the dude who took my chain and said, that didn't happen either. Trey just said it to the whole crew, to his homies. He was like, one of the enemies is here, something like that. Pop is the one who just snapped and just charged him and start fighting him. I definitely think the LAPD and these people, when people like Pop or Malcolm X, 
or as influential people, especially for our people, they not really gonna care about solving a murder or who killed them. Their goal is like, look, man, this person, he had a lot of power. A lot of people looked up to him. He spoke out against the injustice that the police department are doing. They not gonna really care about solving these things or really care about who did this to these individuals. It all comes down to that. These stories, unfortunately, become played over and over again in our neighborhoods. I'm sure if it was somebody else on the caliber of Park from a different race, they would have probably did everything to even protect them, to not even let people get to them. But we have something as a Muslim, we say Qadr Allah Mashafa, that it's the decree of Allah and Allah does what he wants. So the Qadr Allah, it was his time and it was his moment to pass on and nothing we can do about it. To your knowledge, was Pac ever a member of the Ma Pa Rules? Did he ever get put onto any hoods while he was out there? Being that he was repping them so hard at one point in time? You do have Pac yelling out mob. He did get the tattoo. You do have homies from the hood that raised him as a, a member of the mob. But as me personally, hearing Pac saying, yeah, I'm a mob, Pac rule blood, I never heard him come out of his mouth. You know, I heard him mention mob and records and stuff like that. But I always looked at it from a standpoint of view that he was looking at it like, you know, Suge and his homies, they riding with me, they got my back. Let me show some love back. Because even when he was yelling mob and, and these things on his record, this MOB, he was still around Big Psych and Bogart. So I don't know, man, it's one of them things. And we was youngsters, man, so a lot of things he probably kept away from us purposely. If you speak to some of the people from the mob, they're gonna say, yeah, Pac was mob. He was from the hood. I never heard him say I'm from the mob other than rap. He was very close with him, had a lot of love for him, respected him. He also had a lot of crip homies that he respected. So I think Pac was one of them type of individual that he was loved by the mob. He was loved by Suge and his homie, even Crips. But his loyalty, of course, Suge bailed him out. The people who was on the front line as far as security and protecting Pop, it was the homies from Suge Hood, from the Mob Paru, you know? In March 1997, Big was killed. Now, what went through your mind when you heard that news? Losing Biggie, it definitely was a, another loss for our community. My mindset that I have now is different than the way I was thinking back then. We heard Biggie got killed. It took us by surprise, you know what I mean? But, you know, I was in LA and I was listening to the radio and the things that he said on the radio. They was taking some calls and people was telling him they felt like he disrespected Pac on that interview he did in LA. And they was telling him, you need to get out of LA. So me knowing the West Coast, me knowing the coach out there, you got to take threats serious. It wasn't really a shock that it happened because I, I kind of heard that interview and I kind of see where it was going, but it was a loss. It was another big loss that, um, you know, we had to endure. After Pac passed away, right, where did you go? Were you still part of the Outlaws? Did you continue making music? We kind of went under the radar because we signed a record deal with Suge, and when Suge was locked up, he couldn't really deliver on what he promised us, so we had to go to court to get off that record deal with him, and that kind of took like a year or two away from us. Around 99, we was able to release, our, I believe, our first independent record, and also we released the album, the Tupac Outlaw album, and I was involved in all these records, but we lost a couple years going to battle back and forth with Suge. A story about you pulling up on someone with Heron in L.A. Can you tell us about that story? I used to go out to Compton a lot with Heron because he was staying out in the valley. I was staying out in the valley. He would hit me up some day. Like, he used to call me Outlaw. What's up, Outlaw? Where you going? What you doing? I'm like, nah. He's like, come to Compton with me. So I would meet him, park my car, get in the car with him, and we'd drive to Compton. And we used to do this often. One day I was there with him, and he got a call from Risky. Risky is the homie who drew like the Machiavelli album, the Dog Pound albums, Snoop Dogg album. He the one who drew all the album covers. Risky is the homie. I guess some people was trying to press him and push up on him, so he called Heron. So I just remember Heron like, yeah, man, Risky, you know, some dudes are tripping, man. We gotta go over there to Risky crib and see what's up with these dudes. And I always had a strap on me. Heron's like, you strap, little homie? I was like, yeah, you know, I keep one on me. So I had a gun on me, he had a gun on him, and we went over there and we jumped out on the dudes and, you know, what's happening, what's going on. Eventually, when they seen Heron roll up, they ain't really want no issues and they squashed it. It was a situation that could have got out of control and I'm just young and just wild, not even knowing what's happening, but I always was down for the cause back then.
Now, I'm going to throw some names at you, and I just want you to tell me what you remember about these individuals and what type of individuals they were. Johnny J, Hussein Fatal, and Big Sight. I actually did a whole album with Johnny J. After I accepted the religion of Islam, I kind of left the outlaws because I wanted to try to do street music without cuss words and stuff like that. I was trying to adhere to the tenets of my religion as best as possible. And I get a call one day from Johnny J. He was like, look, Mo, I want to do an album on you. I'm starting my own record label. And um, I signed a deal with him. Johnny J was like a big brother to me. Good dude, family man. I was in the studio with him every day for like a year. Unfortunately, he passed away. Some people say he was murdered. Some people say he committed suicide. It's a lot of mystery around his death. He died in the county jail. He was a good dude, big brother to me. Hussein Fatal, that was another dude, man. Allah Yerhamma, he was a solid dude. One of the most loyalist dudes to Gaddafi. That was Gaddafi, homie. Really, like, they grew up together. He was a good dude, street dude. You know, a legend in his neighborhood, for sure. And Big Psych, man, that's the big homie. That's Big Psych, was solid as they come. Big homie. Like I said, Big Psych was the first to school me of the gang culture in L.A. Because you need to know, especially if you live in there and you around those that's involved, you need to know how to act and what not to do and what to do. So Big Psych, he was a lawyer dude to Pac. Love Pac, lawyer dude, held Pac down. I remember a story, man, that Big Psych told me. He said, man, his love for Pac was so strong that one day Pac got locked up. He did something in L.A. He went to the county jail and Big Psych was like, man, I ain't want him in the county jail in L.A. because I know how it is with these gangs. Pac was from Oakland. So Big Psych, made himself right there when they was taking Pac. He got arrested purposely so that he could be in the county jail with Pac. And that's how he rolled, that's how he was. He was like, man, I made myself go get locked up so that I can be in the county jail just to hold Pac down. So Big Psych was a loyal individual. Now we all know that Suge is currently serving 28 years. Now have you kept in contact with Suge over the years? And in your opinion, where did it all go wrong for Suge? And do you feel he gets a bad rap? It might have been about a year ago. Before that, it probably was a few months, you know, we was in touch a little bit before he got locked up. You have to realize, man, when we come from the streets and we make it, it's important that we try to keep trouble away from us, especially if we try to go the legal route. And I think that was like sugar problems, a lot of issues that kept coming to him. And he went at it head on from a street point of view. When you get into that limelight, you got to react differently. You have to switch it up, especially if you worth $300 million dollars. You have to switch it up so that these people don't put you under the jail because that's their goal. They don't want you to have that money in the first place. So they're not going to let you have that money and you still running around wild. They're going to definitely try to separate you from that money. And he had interviews and he used to say that. But I definitely think he get a bad rap. He did a lot of good for people. And his situation is definitely unfortunate. You was running around with Pac. You were so close to Pac running around in the industry. Did the industry or uh, some things that you might have seen prompt you to take your Shahada and accept Islam? After the death of Pac, the death of Gaddafi, I was still doing music. I was just a wild individual. I was just very wild, man. I'm talking about every single day, getting drunk, getting high, going to nightclubs in LA. Every club that I went to, I got into a fight. I was just living a reckless life and I was unhappy. We started making money when we put out the Still I Rise album. First check I received every six months, we was getting $150,000, $175,000. And I started to make a little bit of money, purchase my house, purchase a car, but I realized I was depressed and I was unhappy. And I got to the point in my life where I was like, you know what, something have to change. I was drinking, not even to have fun anymore. I was drinking because I was addicted. So you get tired of that lifestyle. Like I put up an excerpt on my book and when you hear Young Noble saying that they didn't even want to go to clubs with me, that was true. You know, my own homies, when I be like, y'all want to go out, let's go to this club, nope. Because they know that I'm going to get there, I'm going to drink and I'm going to start a fight. I'm talking about, we used to go to clubs in LA and I'll start a fight and it'd be 20, 30 of us fighting another 20, 30 dudes. And that's how I used to have fun. But eventually, you know, something gonna happen. I'm gonna either end up doing something, put myself in prison, or somebody gonna murder me. That's how it was. So the way that I was living my life, it was just so wild. Every single day, I just started searching for happiness. I knew that my mother and father were Muslim, and I wanted something. I was searching. I just felt like I had this empty hole in my heart. After a while, I got tired of drinking. I got tired of smoking, so I needed something else, and that's what I found in Islam. How do you go from living in the United States to settling in the United Arab Emirates? And why did you move? When I came to Saudi Arabia, 
I didn't have no connection here other than my family, my wife and my kids that moved with me. You know, I knew that it was a few brothers that I met from America before I came. I visited a few times. I just wanted a different atmosphere, a different environment. I think when I started having my kids, you know, growing up without a mother and father, that was the first breaks that I started to press down on and started slowing down when I had my first son, Salik, and then I had my son, Muhammad, and then I started getting closer and closer to Islam. And before I had my son, Muhammad, I accepted the religion of Islam. And man, Islam just gave me that sweetness that I was searching for. It just gave me that sweetness, that inner happiness and peace and tranquility. It's almost hard to describe. Once I tasted that, I was like, man, I can't. You know, Allah protect me. I don't want to go back to my old ways. It just opened my eyes. I realized the way that I was living my life wasn't correct. So when I accepted the religion of Islam and I started reading about it, it gave me that discipline and it gave me the happiness that I was searching for. You know, I, I was searching. I think from the time of a youngster, from a shorty growing up without my parents, I was searching. And alhamdulillah, that's what I found in Islam. Tell me how in the time when people usually attach themselves to alcohol, brands, what made you pick coffee and how did you get involved in that? Well, I've always been an entrepreneur, man. Even when I was in the Outlaws, when I take my advancement, I'll go open up a barbershop or I'll go invest into clothing line or I was the first one from the Outlaws that purchased a home. Like, I was always trying to spend my money in a wise way. And when I accepted the religion of Islam, of course, I can't be involved in alcohol. I can't even make money from these type of things. I do have a clothing line, you know what I mean? It took the back seat for now, but we're going to push a new line soon. Um, but coffee was a thing that I was... Um, I always was interested in coffee as a commodity. When I did my research and realized that coffee is the, the second beverage that people drink around the world, the first one is water. Coffee is number one. There's no other beverage being that people are drinking around the world more than coffee besides water. So I knew from reading that right there that this is a lucrative business, but then it's very saturated. There's coffee shops everywhere. The goal is how can I be something different? So I started studying specialty coffee, which is 100% Arabica pure coffee. And it's the science behind the coffee and the way they plant it and they grow it and they dry it and they roast it and they serve it. You know, when I was a kid, my grandfather from my mother's side, he's from Cuba. Her mother's Puerto Rican. He was the first person that ever gave me coffee from Cuba. You know, there's an embargo on Cuba, so they wasn't able to import their coffee to America, but somehow he had Cuban coffee. And when I drank it as a youngster, I remember it had this different, unique taste, but I liked it. And I used to drink it with him often. Then I went through my years in the music industry, drinking alcohol and stuff like that. And it's crazy when I stopped drinking alcohol, I just remember that taste of that drink that my grandfather gave me as a youngster. I guess I needed to keep drinking something strong, but something halal, something permissible. So I pretty much got into coffee. I started drinking coffee. You know, it became part of the culture in America. I wanted to, you know, try a business out. I investigated the business of coffee, and um, now I have my coffee brand. So, yo, Mo, I know you got a book and a documentary. Where can the people view and where can they purchase the book and the documentary, bro? Documentary, they can um, watch it on Amazon Prime. My book, Life is Raw, it's gonna be available soon. I'm gonna post on my IG page, Facebook page, let the people know where they can download it, they can order it. We in talks with a company now, so we hoping to get some good news soon. And um, the book, man, it was an emotional roller coaster. You know what I mean? It made me even more thankful to be guided away from that life. Now in closing, what message would you have for that kid that's, you know, thinking about getting involved in the street life? What would you tell them based off your experience? The streets, it's not loyal at all. You know, the streets is cutthroat. You really have real homies that's really down for you. They turn their back on you, they snitch on you, they cross you. Nothing good comes out of the street, either prison or death. Nobody was able to defeat the streets. The reality, man, don't even waste your life in that. You know what I mean? If you go to a prison and you go speak to prisoners with the lifers and people that's doing 20 30 40 years they would say the same thing man look when i was your age i thought it was all fun until it caught back up to me my homies my closest homies turned their back on me now they're sitting in the prison doing 20 30 40 years can't even hug their mother can't even raise their kids this is not the life nobody want or you're going to be in a cemetery there's nothing good going to come out of that so i would tell the youngsters man don't don't throw your life away get an education finish your school start a business raise your family you're not going to get a good quality of life from the streets. It just ain't going to happen.